95 and increase the presence of publicly available fast chargers in the state by approximately 50 percent. While it will vary by location after permitting, we expect the stations to be built uh, within a matter of weeks. This investment is in addition to the private investment for charging stations at every service plaza on Florida's Turnpike that I also announced last year. Those stations will also delay because of the pandemic will largely be complete within the next 60 days. The result of all this work will mean electric car owners will not have to worry about where they will be able to charge their car when using our major highways. Uh, and this is important, obviously, for, for travel normally, uh, but also critically for hurricane evacuation. Um, and this comes as Floridians and Americans continue to purchase more and more electric vehicles. Electrical vehicle purchasing in Florida has increased tenfold in the last nine years, and we expect uh, that trend to continue. The terms of the Volkswagen settlement limit the amount of funds that we can use on EV infrastructure to 15% of the total 166 million. So we're, we can use about 25 million. Uh, that means that this, this, this initial $8.5 million investment um, is one chunk, but we do have more money uh, that we can use for EV infrastructure, and we're really looking um, to do that. One of the things that we were really uh, concerned about is making sure that the charging stations that'd be on the interstate would be the fast charging stations. You know, you go in, you plug, you go um, to like a gas station or something inside the service store, get a drink, and you come out, and the thing can be charged um, in a relatively short amount of time. Some of the longer charging stations would take sometimes uh, 30 minutes or more. Uh, that may be more uh, conducive for residential use or for um, if you're within, within a neighborhood, uh, normal stores. But when you're traveling like this, we want to be able to get it done quickly. So these are all the fast charging stations. Now the remainder of the 166 million will largely be used on electric or alternative fuel school and transit buses and the replacement of other high emission vehicles. Um, I really appreciate the private sector's involvement in these plans. I want to continue to partner with them going forward. Um, autonomous vehicles, electrical, uh, electric vehicle infrastructure uh, and beyond, Florida will always embrace the intersection between transportation and technology. So we're glad that this was uh, something we were able uh, to move forward. And I'm going to uh, recognize our uh, DP. If you look at the map here, uh, that shows where the chargers are, are going to be go going into. So you see there's obviously, you know, a lot in, uh, in, in Central Florida, 95, a lot, 75. And obviously, as we get more uh, into this, you know, we're going to expand across I-10, more into the panhandle. I mean, we tried to focus on the areas that had the most electrical vehicle use, and those tended to be Southern Florida and Central Florida. Uh, so we're doing that. Obviously, we want to continue to make that uh, all the way through I-10, which we have the funds to do, and that will be next uh, up. And, um, you know, I think it's really, really exciting. So I want to thank NOAA for really working hard to push this through. And uh, we, we did have delays because of the pandemic, uh, but we obviously want to continue to make sure we're doing the folks' business. So, NOAA. Thank you, Governor. So I would... Um, my name is Noah Valenstein. I have the privilege of being the Secretary for the Department of Environmental Protection here in the great state of Florida. And thank the Governor for his leadership. It was just last week that we were celebrating uh, major accomplishments that the Governor pushed forward for legislation to protect our water here in Florida. And we'd like to thank two of the sponsors here today with uh, Senator Mayfield and Representative Fine who helped champion those major pieces of legislation. Um, today is all about air. Again, it's another day, another step forward for the environment here in Florida. It's exciting to see what we've done here in Florida. Under the governor's leadership just this March, we met all national ambient air quality standards here in Florida. We are now the most populous state in the nation to meet all ambient air quality standards. So that was a great step forward. Since 2000, we've actually seen a 78% um, drop in industrial emissions. And so really the next step about clean air here in Florida to continue our trend of having the cleanest air on record is putting in electrical vehicle uh, charging stations throughout Florida, making sure we have a robust enough network that we can really take advantage of that and then have that also play into 
clean air here in Florida. So it has been a great privilege under the governor's leadership to partner with the Department of Transportation. As the governor mentioned, this initial award of just a little more than $8.5 million will move forward 74 electric charging stations. When combined with what the Department of Transportation is doing on the turnpike, that'll be more than 100 electric charging stations here in Florida. We look forward to this current budget year that just started July 1, the governor's leadership and thanks to the legislative support, we've got a record funding now for uh, budget authorization for VW settlement. So we're looking at $67 million this year to quickly move forward with the rest because as the governor certainly hinted at, money doesn't do anyone any good sitting in a trust account. It needs to be out being put to use um, in our economy and making sure that we actually have electric charging stations to get going. And we are very excited to see that as a department. So Governor, thank you. And these, um, I mean, like these Teslas, um, you know, I've got a chance to ride in a couple of them. Really, really uh, phenomenal uh, vehicles. Uh, I got a, a number of updates about um, you know, actions we're doing uh, to combat uh, COVID-19. We're in very close contact uh, with, with all the major healthcare providers, particularly the, the hospitals. Uh, one of the good things about uh, what they're doing now compared to where they were in March uh, is we do have availability of some therapeutics, uh, most notably uh, remdesivir, which was uh, an emergency uh, approval. Uh, I think that was uh, within the last couple months. HHS had sent remdesivir to the Florida Department of Health. We distributed that to the hospitals. Um, hospitals believe, most of the physicians I talked to believe that it has been helpful. So um, they're using it, uh, they, they like it. Uh, they were scheduled to get another shipment, but no longer through the state. They were gonna go straight to the hospitals. Uh, the problem is the timing of that was not good. Some of them were running low. Uh, so I went and uh, spoke, uh, you know, requested through the vice president, through Secretary Azar, uh, that we get accelerated remdesivir to be brought down to the state of Florida. Um, and I'm happy to report that on Saturday, uh, our hospitals uh, will be receiving uh, additional remdesivir. So we've got 427 additional cases coming. That's 17,000. Uh, in 80 additional vials uh, of remdesivir. So that'll be something uh, that hopefully will help uh, to improve patient outcomes, uh, particularly uh, when the patient comes in early. Uh, I think with all this stuff, it's found that, you know, once a patient progresses, if they're at the stage of like mechanical ventilation, a remdesivir is probably not gonna be able to do much at that time. But if they come in immediately, uh, early on in the onset of symptoms, you know, this from Desivere, the physicians I've spoken to have been very favorable with it. Uh, so we're working hard to do that. We're glad that we're able uh, to accelerate that. That's really gonna make a difference uh, for a lot of patients. Of course, another, um, this is actually a positive update. The long-term care facilities obviously is ground zero when you're talking about COVID-19. Uh, we've had more uh, fatalities uh, over the age of 85 than we've had under the age of 65 in the state of Florida. Nationwide, I think at least 50%, if you counted it honestly, uh, of the COVID-related fatalities have been residents of long-term care facilities. So that's been probably the tip of our sphere in terms of protective efforts. We had tested uh, the residents and the staff April, May, the beginning of June. Uh, now that we kind of went through that iteration, we instituted requirement of testing every two weeks all staff members at long-term care facility have to test every two weeks. And that's almost 200,000 people because we've got over 4,000 facilities in the state of Florida. So that's a big deal. Uh, we have a, a process in place. We've got a company that's, uh, that's helping us do it. So we have now have uh, about 70,000 test results back from the staff. We have 50,000 that are pending at the lab. And then we have many more that are being swabbed and sent in um, as we speak. The positivity rate for the long-term care staff after 70,000 tests is 2.4%. Uh, and, and that's very, very low generally. But obviously when you look in the communities, you know, we're seeing uh, positivity uh, in places like Dade County, 20%. You know, Orange today was 10%. You know, we'll see these things can, you know, there's signal noise. Um, that was a good sign, hopefully that continues. But to have the long-term care staff still testing low, because I think our fear is, is you know, when you have community transmission, that's a reflection of the community. If you're working at a long-term care, you, know, you could still be somebody that's doing it. 
Uh, so I think having this in place is allowing us to catch it early. Uh, and so we're looking forward to continue getting those results. That was a big investment on the part of the state, uh, but I think that that's an investment that's it's very well served. So we appreciate uh, what's happening there. The testing overall uh, is obviously very robust. I mean, we've got back today reported 95,000 test results in one day in the state of Florida. If you go back at the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, our country initially wasn't even doing 95,000 uh, in a day. I think it probably took them sometime towards the middle or end of March to even be able to reach 100,000. So, so this is a robust level of testing. Uh, positivity was down today. We'll see. You got to do this over four or five days to really know. But the Orange County Convention Center site here uh, has done about 64,000 tests during the course of the pandemic. That is the most tests of any single site anywhere in the state. And we actually had some sites that started earlier because the, the outbreak was really most significant initially in South Florida, Broward, Dade. So the first site was in Broward because that's where most of the cases were occurring. Orange County, obviously, we, we did that um, you know relatively short order, but some of these sites have been operating longer in Orange County um, is number one. So they're putting through between 1,500 and 2,000 people uh, a day on that uh, test site. So it's been very, very um, successful. I mentioned yesterday we're continuing to work on uh, figuring out ways to get a faster turnaround. Uh, the U.S. Is, is testing between six and 700,000 people a day now in terms of the results coming back. Uh, that has really put a crush on all these labs. So they, every lab that said they can get you in 48 hours, it's taking more than 96. If they say 72, it's taking like a week. And part of that is just they're getting overwhelmed. Um, they're running lower on some of the reagents and some of the supplies. We have some ways with self-swabbing and certain labs that are dedicated to that to potentially improve the turnaround for at least some of the test takers. And so what we're gonna work on doing, we'll do that at the Orange County Convention Center, is to have uh, lanes for people who are actually symptomatic. I mean, most of the people who are testing now, you know, are not necessarily symptomatic. And so if somebody is actually ill, you know, they need to know whether that's coronavirus or not as quickly as possible. And so if we can dedicate that, they can go through hopefully get it turned around in decent time uh, because you know to just what are you going to do isolate for seven days while you're waiting for test results that's not what we want to see uh, so we're working on that uh, it's important but that will definitely focus on our symptomatic test takers we're also uh, uh, supporting and monitoring you know our pillars have always been protect the vulnerable expand testing social distancing and support our our healthcare system hospitals and the capacity uh, we have COVID only nursing home units all across the state now. We've got 12 of them. We didn't have uh, that. Nobody had that in March. In fact, Florida is one of the only states that have gone this route even now. Uh, now, Orange County uh, really has done a good job. They've had relatively few cases in their long term care facilities compared to some other parts of the state. Uh, but it's very, very important to have those facilities. We're expanding beds in those facilities. So we had started with all 12, about 750 beds. We're looking at, at ramping as many of those up as we can. You know, what happens in these nursing homes is you'll have folks test positive. Not all of them need hospitalization. In fact, fortunately, a lot of them don't. Uh, but if they're contagious, you know, we need to move them to a safe environment so that it doesn't spread further in the facility. So those COVID-only nursing home units are very, very important. We're also, we have had at the Department of Emergency Management a number of contracted healthcare workers. Um, and some of them have been working these test sites the whole time. Others are just contracts that we can then execute. Uh, we are moving some of them to the long-term care COVID only to help expand beds. And we're also helping with personnel um, at some of the areas that are most busy with, with hospitals, uh, you know, such as Jackson down in Miami-Dade. Uh, we're also doing Tampa Bay. So we're going to end up having, in very short order, an additional thousand uh, boots on the ground that could assist in a variety of ways, testing, you know, helping out different uh, hospital systems, long-term care, you name it. That's a real force multiplier. When we're talking to the uh, hospitals, and you know, I'm talking to a, a lot of the, the CEOs um, all the time, and um, they have capacity. I mean, we've got uh, the census today, I think between 10 and 12, 13,000, somewhere like that, beds are available, even at a place like Jackson Memorial, which is uh, 
in kind of the, the, the center of where we're seeing the most cases down in Miami-Dade. You know, they've calibrated with how they're doing electives and everything, you know, to have a nice cushion of beds. Um, but it's uh, the staffing because of how labor intensive it is when you're doing the COVID isolation procedures. And so, you know, we're sensitive to that. We obviously plan for that. And so we have it. But I think it's an important message for folks throughout the state of Florida to just know, you know, the hospitals have capacity. I mean, like, there'll be articles saying, oh, my gosh, they're at 90%. Well, that's how hospitals normally run. I mean, you don't make – running at 60 percent or 70 is not how they normally run. Or they'll say, oh, there's these counties that have no ICU beds. Yeah, we have a lot of rural counties that don't have any ICU beds at all. That's just not how they operate. They send people to bigger systems. So we have a situation where you've got a lot of beds available, no um, uh, major system or no, no, nobody that, that we have been seen yet has even gone to like a surge level. Um, and so, you know, these are all contingencies that are there. But the important message is if you have uh, symptoms aside from coronavirus, heart, stroke, we don't want to repeat the situation that we saw across the country in March and April where people were deterred, whether it was because of fear, whether it was because they didn't think there would be beds available, from seeking the type of care that they need, particularly for those conditions like heart, like stroke, which are some of the leading causes of death in the United States. And what we've seen over the last month or so is a lot of those patients who did defer care are now presenting in the hospitals and ICUs with more severe heart problems or more severe problems uh, because of stroke symptoms than had they gone in and gotten treated. So please, um, you know, if you feel like you need care, do not be dissuaded Hospitals do all, you know, they're, 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 that's one of the safest places you can be in terms of the isolation uh, with all the procedures they have in place. And they have the capacity to be able to treat people, um, and we want people to be able to get the care that they need. We need to continue working on protecting the vulnerable, particularly those who are 65 and older, particularly those that have underlying medical conditions. Of course, our long-term care facilities, uh, which we're putting a lot of emphasis on. Uh, but if you're in those at-risk groups and you're not in a long-term care facility, uh, you know, our advisory is still to avoid, avoid crowds and limit close contact with people outside the home. Uh, it, that is going to be higher risk, particularly, you know, as you've seen more cases in the community. Now, look, we, Orange County had 10 percent today. You know, we'll see if, if that trend, there's some other counties, um, you know, that are down from, from where they peaked at with the percentages. These things take some time to do, but, but regardless of that, uh, I think that this is something that's very, very prudent. Just know that this is out there, and particularly what we're finding is, you know, these multi-generational households uh, in different parts of the state, you know, particularly in some of the areas in Dade County where you've seen a lot of cases, uh, you have somebody who may be asymptomatic, maybe younger, then maybe you have a parent, a grandparent. Uh, inside that home, that's going to be a very powerful vector uh, of transmission of this virus. And so be very cognizant uh, about that if you're in those at-risk groups. Uh, for the folks who may not be uh, as, as at risk, uh, our message is, is to avoid the three C's, uh, closed, poorly ventilated spaces. And here in Florida, as you see, I mean, we're out here. I'm sweating. Most of you are probably sweating a little bit. It's hot. I get it. People want to be in the AC. Uh, but if you're having friends over, if you're having a party, you're doing something, and you are in an enclosed environment, there is going to be increased risk of transmission in that vis-a-vis -vis outdoor environment with sunshine, heat, and humidity. I think that's abundantly clear uh, where we've seen cases come from. And you're, you're seeing it over and over again if somebody ends up at the ED uh, you know, where, where, what have you been doing? Friends, family, friends, family. Either get in a home or be with friends. I mean, that's pretty much, you know, what we're seeing overwhelming. Not entirely. Obviously, there's different other ways, but that's overwhelming what we're seeing. Uh, so those closed, poorly ventilated spaces increase risk. Big crowds, obviously, increase risk. Uh, and then a lot of close, sustained contact. Uh, when you're inside that six-foot radius, especially if you're with someone for a long period of time, you know, fleeting contact, not really significant source of transmission, but if you're there, you know, 30 minutes or so, 15 minutes, just the risks are enhanced. Now, if you can't do the proper social distancing, you know, we're recommending, you know, that you wear a facial covering, but just understand that's in addition to doing social distance. Uh, the social distance, avoiding the three C's, you know, is the best way. Um, you know, if you don't do that, if you're in a closed space, if you're in crowd, close contact, 
you know, the facial covering is not going to stop uh, all the all the uh, the, the droplets. Um, it could reduce, uh, but that physical distance really is significant as well. So it's a complement, uh, but not a substitute. And I think if folks, um, you know, are doing those basic things, you know, we're going to continue to be able to, to hopefully see, um, you know, good trends uh, develop. Uh, like I think Orange County has done a really good job from the beginning. Um, you know, maybe too soon to say for sure, um, but I think you've definitely noticed, um, you know, a slowdown in terms of some of the positivity, and, and that's a really, really good sign. Um, and with that, I'll take some questions. Uh, yes, Governor, sir. a quick question for you. Uh, Dr. Fauci has said that Florida may have skipped some steps in opening too quickly. What do you say to parents who are concerned about schools opening too quickly next month? Well, in terms of our reopening, so I sent mine to the task force. I spoke specifically with Dr. Burks. And if you look at, we did phase one at the beginning of May. Our best test results were May and the first two weeks of June. We were 5% or under that whole time. This is a virus that has a five-day incubation period, so it wouldn't take six weeks before you started seeing something if that were the, the cause. And so there were no steps. We had very, very low prevalence and particularly in the 64 counties outside of Southern Florida, and we did put Southern Florida on a different on a different pathway. Um, so I think it, there was really no justification to not move forward because of, of the low, and that continued all through May, continued in the early part of June, and then we've now seen uh, more cases in transmission at the exact same time that the rest of the Sun Belt is. Los Angeles didn't exactly open very soon there. They're seeing it. Texas, Georgia. Arizona, South Carolina. So this is something that we're dealing with. We're in a better position to deal with it. You know, in terms of the schools, you know, my, my view is, is let's look at what the, the accumulated data has shown us about, you know, how coronavirus affects different groups. And I don't think there's anybody who can make an argument uh, that this is especially risky for kids. For whatever reason, uh, if you look at the H1N1, that was definitely more risky for kids uh, than, than the COVID-19, and yet we didn't do. So my view is is parents should have the ability to make the decisions they want, and if they want to do the, uh, the online stuff, that's fine. But just understand the cost of not giving kids an option to be able to have in-person instruction is enormous. And um, I get there's a lot of views in the community. What I would hope is it should not be a political uh, issue. It should be based on the facts. And, and, and if we see that this is very low risk and we see, I think, overwhelmingly in every study that the school kids are not vectors of transmission, uh, well, then we have to accept that and then figure out, you know, how you fashion policy around it. But um, the places that have done this in other parts of the world, you know, have not seen major problems. Look, you can always have an outbreak. We've said that from the beginning, um, and you do what you can to, to, to put it out. But in terms of the risk level to school kids is very low. The cost of not at least giving them the opportunity if their parents want to do it, you know, I think is very, very high. Um, and so it doesn't mean that you don't do things to, to create safe environments. And I certainly would recommend uh, that folks, uh, you know, if you have somebody, a school-aged ch children that have real serious medical conditions, they obviously need to be protected and treated um, uh, accordingly. And the same thing with people who may work um, in these things. But um, the the cost of what we've already seen with the academic lag has been really, really significant. And this is from a state that has put more into online learning than probably any state in the country. We're proud of it. A lot of states copied us. Uh, we think we did a good job mitigating some of it, but there's no way that you can actually substitute that. And then I also worry about kids just not being able to have the normal type of uh, interactions that we're used to. Um, there's social costs to that, uh, obviously activities that many of our kids like to participate in. I mean, I'm really, I'd be really concerned about not letting our, our athletes uh, compete uh, a lot. Look, kids, uh, particularly in high school, that's one of the reasons, one of the things that keeps them going in a good direction because they have the ability, they have mentorships by coaches, they're working hard, they're learning discipline. So there's a whole host of factors. Um, so let's just follow the data and the actual science. Let's take the politics out of it. Let's take the, um, you know, some of the emotion out of it. I mean, I've said before, you know, my kids are three, two, and a newborn. So they're just too young to be in school now. But if they were seven, uh, uh, six, and five, I'd have no problem. I, I, I view it as incredibly low risk, 
as somebody who reviews this data for hours every day, um, you know, I would be um, I would be totally comfortable with that, and I would be concerned at what they would be losing uh, w without that. So it's a really significant thing. It also, though, doesn't mean that every single school district in every part of the state is going to approach it the same way. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we have a diverse state. There's going to be some places here, they're going to be full throttle, we know that, and then there's others that are going to be more, a little bit more cautious. That's fine, too. But I think the goal needs to be, you know, let's do what's best for the kids and let's make it happen. Well, that's a separate issue from this announcement. I mean, this is an announcement about infrastructure, about uh, modernizing, you know, Florida's transportation system. But in terms of people that are unemployed, we had a nice uh, increase in May. People didn't think that was going to happen. We don't know specifically for Florida yet for June, but the country's numbers were good. So we anticipate seeing that. Uh, hopefully, uh, some good numbers for Florida there too. We are going to put people back to work. I mean, we've got to have society function. Uh, we know a lot about this virus. We, we know the at-risk groups. We know some of the things that can be done to be effective. Uh, but we've got to give people that ability to get back to work, uh, to be able to provide uh, food for their families. Now, we uh, have paid out over $9.5 billion in the various types of unemployment benefits, which is like way more than this state has ever done, even over the last, uh, I think, five years combined. Um, that's not obviously something that most people want to work, uh, but that was something that, that, that has been uh, put a lot of effort into because we had a lot of problems. Uh, but we want to put people back to work. And yes, look, I can't afford a Tesla either. I mean, I, but it's something that these, as these things become more affordable, more widely available, having that infrastructure there, I think will be really, really positive. The unemployment trust fund is below the, the threshold that would trigger an unemployment tax increase uh, in the next year. Do you anticipate that happening for employers or do you think it's a way to avoid that? I hope we can avoid it. I mean, I think that this is a unique economic uh, occurrence because it was basically a national shutdown that caused people to lose their jobs based on a policy. And um, usually these things happen organically. You know, there's over leveraging or there's this or there's that. Um, so I'm hoping that because it was artificially induced, we can get people back and, you know, we won't have, uh, we won't have that happen. Can you repeat? Well, we obviously are working hard to, um, you, you know, to minimize the morbidity and mortality associated with this virus. I mean, I, if you look at what we've done with our long-term care facilities, uh, I think had we not done what we've done, uh, you would have thousands of more fatalities in our long-term care facilities. Certainly, you know, if we would have put the contagious patients back in there, it would have just been uh, a, a disaster like you've seen in some of these other states. So, yes, we want to reduce as much as possible. Now, when the deaths are reported, just understand this stuff, some of these go back to April, May. Um, and so it's not that it happened the day before, but yes, we want to, we want to reduce uh, more, or limit as much as we can, reduce mortality, morbidity. I think if you look at the numbers, uh, the 65 and the long-term care, that is overwhelmingly where we're finding the most significant clinical outcomes. Not only, but overwhelmingly. And I think if you look at the, the cases which have just piled up under 45, um, I think we've got, I think in the last five or six weeks, I mean, we've probably had 120, 130,000 cases under 45. And if you look at the uh, mortality rate for that, it is incredibly, incredibly low and probably close to zero for people that don't have underlying conditions. So I'm concerned, you know, obviously the cases are, in, 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 you know, it's an, it's an indicator. Um, but who is getting infected is the most significant indicator about how those trends will go. And so if we can continue to focus protecting our long-term care, protecting our, our, our elderly, and obviously uh, the messaging about um, you know, limiting the crowds and the contact for those most at risk, that is going to make um, a very, very big difference. So I really, though, appreciate uh, what people have been doing across the state. I mean, if you look at the folks who've been working uh, in our hospitals, they were on alert uh, March, April. Yeah, obviously, we had you know kind of a ripple come through, uh, and then we were very quiet, uh, relatively quiet, 
in May and the beginning of June. You know, now we've seen it pick up. So folks are working really, really hard, and uh, the state of Florida very much appreciates uh, everything everyone's doing, both in the healthcare field, also our Florida National Guard. I mean, they've been on this for since the middle of March, and they've been deployed. They're doing all our testing sites. They've gone and tested the nursing homes. I mean, they've just done um, a, a bang up job. And, and it's been, uh, you know, when you flat, have a flatter curve, which Florida has, I mean, if you look at kind of Northeast, they went boom, Florida, Texas, I mean, we're just much flatter. It means it goes on longer. And so, you know, it was said you wanted a flatter curve, but this, it's drawn out over a longer period of time. There's no question that has given our healthcare system a better chance at, at dealing with the clinical consequences of this. We have PPE, we have a lot of stuff that was, that was tough at the beginning, but it does mean it goes on um, you know, longer than if you had a boom or bust. So um, I'm very appreciative for all the hard work that people have put in uh, on this, uh, really since um, probably the beginning of March, because we were you know, seeing this in February, and I know it's been a lot. So, so thanks everybody, and I'm gonna have an update soon, uh, another update tomorrow um, about, uh, about some more next steps, thank you.